Meta's future plans for VR interest me because I see them as being like a sneak peek to maybe 5 or 10 years into the future, and as how advanced the VR devices we'll be using might be by then. But it isn't just the headsets that are evolving, it's also how we might use the technology. And if Meta's vision becomes a reality, it won't just shape the future of entertainment, but also that of work and of human interaction itself. And Meta is one of the very few companies capable of funding this level of research and development. So if nothing else, you get to see all the cool stuff they've been working on, and a greater appreciation for the immense challenges required on the road to building a perfect VR device. In the short term, expect smaller, incremental improvements with each generation of VR headset released, with the next device being Project Cambria. Meta's product teams are always developing a few generations of VR headset in advance, but Meta also has a research department, and these engineers are looking further into the future and at all the far off problems that they will eventually face. And it's these projects that this video will cover. Mark Zuckerberg believes that VR is already capable of creating the feeling of existing in a virtual environment, but that the experience will become increasingly believable and vivid as we approach and eventually surpass the visual Turing test. This is the point where VR becomes visually indistinguishable from reality, and to achieve that it takes more than just a higher resolution, although that also helps. These prototypes I'll be covering don't try to cram the best of everything into a single headset. Each device focuses on doing just one thing as well as it can. Some of these technologies may be 5 or even 10 years away, and it would be impossible to cram the best of all four into one device just now, because the technology isn't there. But by building these cutting edge prototypes, it helps give them a better idea of what future headsets will require, and the problems they'll face getting there. And remember, no matter how advanced these headsets may get, the headsets Meta eventually releases will still need to be portable, battery powered, and affordably priced. So obviously, Meta are paving the way for a virtual world of sorts, where you can interact with other people from wherever you want to, taking your VR device between rooms and places like you would currently a phone. Meta believes the magic of VR is in its ability to give a sense of presence, and that this sensation will get better as they tackle the limitations of the tech and the barriers of entry. In a way, the future is already here, more and more people are working from home, and while this brings about many benefits, it can also cut people off socially. So you can already see how interacting with people in VR could help reintroduce a more natural element to socialisation again. Compared to a Zoom meeting, a VR meeting in workrooms can be more human. Everybody's avatar has a place and presence in the room, which allows you to do all sorts of things that you can in reality, like to whisper to the person next to you, or to express yourself with your hands, or by pointing at things. A VR space can already achieve more than a Zoom call can, and it's only going to get better. The first of Meta's super experimental headsets that I'll be covering is the Butterscotch prototype, which prioritises a high resolution, which is an obvious benefit. But how high does a VR headset's display have to be before it's good enough? In order to achieve 2020 clarity, which is good enough for most people, it requires about 60 pixels per degree. For reference, the Quest 2 manages about 20, which comparatively can look a bit blurry and you can't read text from too far away. The Butterscotch prototype can go up to about 55, which is getting very good. At that sort of level, reading text at a distance isn't just possible, but it's also quite comfortable to do so. You can also make out subtle textures on surfaces, and the finer details on images and so on. And all this just generally gives you the level of definition that's required to make the world around you feel authentic. And whereas text on a monitor is always displayed on the same pixels and in straight lines, when in VR your head is always tilting and changing its angle and position ever so slightly, and so higher resolutions help keep the text more temporally stable, no matter how shaky your face is. When it comes to pixels, more is obviously better, but the technology isn't there for this level of clarity just yet. Due to the insane pixel definition, Butterscotch's field of view is severely limited, and it's connected to and powered by a desktop PC because that's the processing power that's required to drive such a highly detailed display. Butterscotch can also simulate lower resolutions, allowing for Meta's engineers to experiment and to get a better understanding of how capable each quality setting can be. Mark is confident that high resolutions are the future, saying that each generation of headset tends to improve the resolution by about 10 to 20 percent. So, assuming a 15 percent improvement per generation over the Quest 2, we'll get Retina quality displays in about seven to eight generations' time. So, how do they intend to get around the problem of rendering so many pixels? The key thing is to optimise how things are drawn and to squeeze the absolute most out of the available processing power as possible. And a key part of this is to have accurate eye tracking. Since only the centre of your vision is in high definition, they can use eye tracking to only draw the bit that you're looking at in high clarity, and then for the clarity to gradually fade out into a lower resolution as it moves further away from where you're looking. This alone will greatly optimise things, and by doing so it will cut down on power consumption, which will in turn improve battery life, and will keep the device cooler and more comfortable to wear. Win win win. The Half Dome project is all about its verifocal lenses, because what good is a better quality image if your eyes can't see it in full focus? 
You see, depending on whether you're looking into the distance or at something close up, your eye's position subtly changes, and the way that VR headsets currently display things with just a single lens a set distance away isn't good enough. You won't know why it looks wrong, but it'll look wrong, and in a way that you'll only understand once you try a headset with ferrofocals, which will suddenly feel right, no matter how far away you might be looking. Ferrofocal lenses will result in less strain, which will make prolonged VR sessions feel less tiring, especially if you're doing something close up like reading a book that you're holding. And the beauty is, this can all be done in the SDK, meaning that games and the like don't even need to know that it's a ferrofocal headset, so it should already work with everything that's been released from, like, 2018 onwards. And it doesn't take users of this technology long to adapt to using it in ways that enables behaviours that they just didn't find comfortable using before. Half Dome was shown in several iterations throughout the video. It started as a simple moving lens which could move almost one centimetre back and forth depending on how far away the thing was that you were trying to look at. But over time they've refined the design, gradually removing all of the moving parts to cut down on the noise and the vibration, and the latest version of Half Dome is all electronic, so there's nothing moving about it at all, and it can refocus almost immediately. Everything with VR is a trade-off though, so while the electronic solution using polarised lenses to converge and diverge the light in different amounts may sound ideal, the more layers you add to this, the darker the screen gets. Which is a bad thing. They tested up to 64 levels of focus, but settled on 32 being a sort of sweet spot, which they determined by getting people to test the devices and to say how much they liked them. This is a technology that Mark thinks will come out sooner rather than later, and by that he means that you might see a headset with this sort of technology in the next 5-6 to six years, ish. And it makes me wonder if this sort of technology could find its way into other stuff too, like AR or glasses. Starburst is Meta's HDR experiment which aims to have super high levels of brightness and contrast, because it turns out that the real world is much more vivid than what even the best of screens today are capable of outputting. Normal VR is about 100 nits of brightness, but Starburst can go all the way up to 20,000. That may sound blindingly bright, but the real world can get brighter still. However, tests have been done with TVs and stuff to see where the sweet spot is, and from Meta's own testing with their headset, they seem to throw the 10,000 nit figure about as though that's the goal that they're happy to aim for. So what difference does this increased brightness make? I suppose it's harder to describe HDR than it is to, say, describe a higher resolution, but more brightness gives more perceived depth to an image. White is no longer just a whitish colour, but is instead an intense, glowing bright area. In fact, the Starburst prototype is bright enough for you to feel your eyes physically adapting to changes in brightness, and it's stuff like this which goes a long way towards aiding in the immersion of VR by imitating how our eyes adapt to real life conditions. It isn't just about the bright bits though. Contrast is also key, and they've kept the dark bits looking dark by combining two different LCDs together, since using just one at double the brightness would also double the brightness of the darker regions of the screen. And they sprayed the inside of the headset black, because that helps too. The problem is the power that's required to produce this much light. It makes the device hot, meaning that it needs to be bigger and bulkier to dissipate that heat, and only about 1% of the light emitted ever reaches your eye due to all of the layers it has to pass through before that point. Mark says a way of improving this would, again, be to work on the eye tracking, and to only shine light where in the headset it is that you're looking, and to focus it directly through your pupil. It sounds very invasive, but this is the sort of thing required to increase the efficiency of a VR display, and to hit the high peaks in brightness that are required to look authentic. So while on the surface it sounds like brighter displays simply need more light, the problem is a difficult one, and Mark hints that this level of HDR might be further off than the verifocal lenses that I spoke about earlier are. The Holocake 2 prototype prioritises comfort. It aims to be as small and as unbulky as possible, and it achieves this via holographic pancake lenses. Would you like the next step beyond the traditional pancake designs currently seen in slimmed VR devices? It isn't just about cutting down on the weight, but also about moving that weight to be closer to your head, which can also make a device feel lighter and more comfortable. And it's a weird experience to wear a VR device that's this thin. You go to adjust its position on your head only to discover it doesn't stick out much further than a pair of glasses would. This is, ideally, how future VR headsets will look. The problem is how you cram all the other technologies into something this small. Unfortunately, these new holographic lenses are not currently as efficient as older designs are, so they will require more work before they hit the market. A large part of the video wasn't about a headset, but was instead about the software that drives them. Software is easier to iterate on than hardware is, because the development time between versions is smaller, so rather than having to wait years to see what people think of an end product, by simulating aspects of it then you can cut that development time down and avoid mistakes that you'd otherwise have made. One thing simulations can really help with is in tackling optical distortion. That's what this monstrosity you can see here is doing. 
so this simulates how displays will look through different lenses, when viewed by different individuals. Getting the lenses for VR devices right requires a lot of testing and tweaking for every different design of headset, so by simulating it all like this, they can evolve the lens design a lot faster than by having to wait for it to be physically created every time first. A lot of the distortion isn't terrible or immediately apparent, but it can still detract from an image's clarity in subtle ways. Canting is when the lenses are tilted at an angle like this to improve the field of view. However, this introduces extra view distortion, which can be addressed with correction software side. And the distortion caused by your eyes glancing about causes real problems too, which includes a phenomenon known as pupil swim. Again, software can be used to address this sort of issue, but it requires near-perfect eye tracking to achieve it. He went on to say that eye tracking will also help them to predict where you'll look even before you've looked there, based on initial eye movements and so on. So this helps them to render the bits that are most important with as little latency as possible. It's all highly intricate, but I got the impression that eye tracking is the key to progressing lots of different aspects of VR devices. To summarise, Meta deliberately over-engineered these prototypes to establish how far they have to go to create an ideal VR device, and to give their engineers a head start in tackling the issues on the road to achieving this. As for which features we'll see and when, they'll be prioritised based on the new possibilities they open up, as well as being dictated by the breakthroughs and holdups we face in the coming years. Meta are already beyond the realm of using what's readily available, so while ideally they'd like to work with other companies to use pre-existing hardware wherever possible, a lot of specialist VR tech hasn't been invented until now, so Meta has to develop these technologies themselves, which is why Mark believes Meta's VR devices will be ahead of the rest when they're released. And the future isn't just virtual, there's also mixed and augmented realities. These all present their own challenges to develop, but by progressing VR they are also solving some of the challenges that they'll later face with these other technologies as well. Will we eventually get a VR headset that combines the best of everything we've seen in this video? Maybe, but maybe we won't want that in 10 years time, depending on what else becomes available or important. Mark Zuckerberg believes they'll eventually end up with two tiers of product, a cheaper one for consumers and a more expensive one for companies which can justify higher costs if it can improve employee productivity even by just a few percent. But he says that even these won't be insanely expensive, they'll more likely be comparable to the cost of a new PC, and obviously economies of scale will help drive prices down, and the benefits of one will eventually be passed down to the other product stacks. Now you know this summary, you can watch and more fully appreciate the full video for its deeper dive.